The GRADE approach offers a structured framework for assessing the certainty of evidence and supporting healthcare decision making, especially in the development of recommendations. Its conceptual foundation supports a systematic, explicit, and transparent process that defines the role of evidence, its certainty, and contextual factors in formulating recommendations and making decisions. GRADE acknowledges the need for judgments in this process. Rather than eliminating judgments or disagreements, GRADE enhances transparency by making these judgments and related deliberations explicit and structured. It also ensures all interest holders are contributing to those deliberations. In this video, we will review two central GRADE concepts, the certainty of the evidence and the strength of the recommendations. The goal is to provide a high-level overview of these concepts. Further details and additional resources are available on the GRADE book website. Certainty of the evidence. GRADE defines certainty of the evidence as the confidence that the true value of an estimate falls within a specific range or above or below a relevant threshold. The type of estimate for which certainty is assessed varies depending on the application of GRADE. In intervention studies, it refers to the treatment effects. When estimating patients' values, it pertains to the relative importance of outcomes. In diagnostic studies, it may reflect the effect of a diagnostic strategy or, more commonly, the diagnostic accuracy measures of a test. In prognostic studies, it typically represents a measure of association between predictors and outcomes. And in environmental health and risk assessment, it generally describes the relationship between exposures and outcomes. Central to the assessment of certainty of the evidence are two key concepts decision thresholds, and the target of the certainty rating. Decision thresholds are reference values that guide judgments about both the size of the effect and the associated certainty of evidence. Eventually, they would also inform judgments about the balance of effects of one option over another and support a particular recommendation. However, for now, we will focus on their role on the certainty assessment. The target of the certainty rating refers to the specific range of effect that is being assessed, for example, a moderate benefit. This range typically corresponds to where the pooled estimate from a meta-analysis lies. For example, in this hypothetical meta-analysis, six decision thresholds are considered, distinguishing between trivial or no important effect and also small, moderate, or large benefit or harm. These thresholds will be used to assess the certainty of the evidence. As shown in the figure, four individual studies are represented by squares, and the pooled estimate from the meta-analysis is represented by a diamond. The pooled estimate falls within the range of moderate benefit, which defines the target for the certainty rating. The certainty assessment will determine how confident we can be that the true effect of the intervention is indeed a moderate benefit. GRADE categorizes the certainty of the evidence as high, moderate, low, or very low. High certainty means that we have high confidence that the true value of the estimate of interest is at one side of a threshold of interest or within a specific range. For example, if the evidence suggests that an intervention has a moderate benefit, high certainty means we are confident that the true effect is indeed a moderate benefit. Moderate certainty means we are moderately confident that the true value of the estimate of interest is at one side of a threshold of interest or within a specific range. However, the true value of the estimate may deviate slightly from the target of the certainty rating. For example, if the evidence suggests that an intervention has a moderate benefit, moderate certainty means the true effect could be slightly smaller or larger, such as a small benefit instead of a moderate benefit. Low certainty means we have limited confidence that the true effect lies on one side of a threshold or within a specific range. In other words, the true value of the estimate may deviate from the target of the certainty rating. For example, if the evidence suggests that an intervention has a moderate benefit, low certainty means the true effect could be in reality a small benefit or no important effect. 
Finally, very low certainty means we have very little confidence about where the true effect lies in relation to the thresholds or range of interest. In this case, the true value of the estimate may deviate significantly from the target of the certainty rating. For example, if the evidence suggests that an intervention offers a moderate benefit, very low certainty means the true effect could be in reality a small benefit, a trivial or unimportant effect, or even a harmful effect. Now, let's explore in more detail the mechanics of the certainty assessment, which involves a four-step process. Step one, determining the number of thresholds. The first step in the assessment is to establish the number of decision thresholds that will be used to evaluate the certainty of the evidence. These thresholds may be determined through consensus or based on empirical data and should be reported transparently. Step two, determining the target of the certainty rating. The second step involves identifying the target of the certainty rating, which typically corresponds to the range within which the point estimate lies. Step three, evaluating the evidence. In this step, grade users systematically assess the eight grade domains. These include the five domains that may lead to rating down the certainty of the evidence, study limitations, inconsistency, indirectness, imprecision, and dissemination bias as well as the three domains that may support rating it up. Large effect, dose response gradient, and the presence of an opposite residual confounding. And finally, step four, determining whether to rate down or up. Identifying a concern in any grade domain does not automatically justify rating down the certainty of the evidence. Rating down is appropriate only when the concern may impact the results. The same principle applies to rating up. Now we're going to take a closer look at the grade certainty assessment process from steps three and four. We'll explore how grade users can assess the certainty of the evidence for intervention questions. In this video, however, we won't go into detail on how each grade domain is operationalized. For interventions, the starting point for rating the certainty of evidence is the study design, broadly separated into two types, randomized controlled trials and non-randomized studies about interventions. In grade, a body of evidence from randomized trials starts with a high certainty rating, whereas evidence from non-randomized studies generally start as low certainty due to the risk of confounding and selection bias. However, if grade users evaluate the risk of confounding formally in non-randomized studies, they may start as high certainty. Although randomized controlled trials are the preferred source of evidence for assessing interventions, grade users often need to rely on non-randomized studies. These studies can complement trial data, provide information on outcomes not adequately captured by trials, or even replace trial data when they offer higher certainty of the evidence. After determining the starting point, the initial ratings are followed by detailed assessments across five domains that can lower certainty and three domains that can increase it. However, it's important to note that the domains used to increase the certainty apply only to non-randomized studies. They should not be used to rate up the certainty of evidence from randomized trials. Let's now examine the five domains that can decrease the certainty of the evidence. Study limitations, also referred to as risk of bias, inconsistency, indirectness, imprecision, and dissemination bias, also known as publication bias. Study limitations. This domain evaluates the risk of bias arising from flaws in the design or implementation of individual studies. For example, studies with important limitations tend, on average, to overestimate the effect of new interventions. The primary method for assessing study limitations involves comparing studies with high and low risk of bias through sensitivity analyses using statistical or graphical tools. However, there are scenarios where it may be necessary to rate down the certainty of the evidence even when sensitivity analyses do not show any apparent differences. For example, when the randomization is compromised or in unblinded studies, if investigator or outcome adjudicators can realistically affect the prognosis of participants or the measurement of the outcomes. 
inconsistency. This domain evaluates whether there are unexplained differences across the study results included in an evidence synthesis. By definition, if only one study is available, there is no concern about inconsistency. If inconsistency can be explained by a small number of a priori subgroup hypotheses, grade users may choose to stratify the evidence on the basis of these factors. However, if the inconsistency remains unexplained, the certainty of the evidence should be rated down. Statistical measures such as I-square and Cochrane's p-value provide an initial assessment of inconsistency. However, the final certainty judgment should be based on examining the effects of individual studies and their relationship with pre-established thresholds or ranges. Indirectness. This domain covers concerns about applicability, generalizability, external validity, translatability and transferability of research results to a question of interest. Grade distinguished population, interventions, comparisons and outcome indirectness in studies of interventions. A special type of indirectness results when two or more options are not directly compared within studies. The primary method for assessing indirectness involves comparing studies with more and less indirectness using statistical or graphical tools. However, there are scenarios where it may be necessary to rate down the certainty of the evidence even when subgroup analyses do not show any apparent differences, for example, when there are concerns about the baseline risk estimate. Imprecision. This domain evaluates the risk of random error within a body of evidence. Confidence intervals around absolute estimates, such as risk differences or mean differences, are the primary tools used to assess imprecision. When these confidence intervals cross predetermined thresholds, grade users should rate down the certainty of the evidence. Additionally, when large effects seem precise based on their confidence intervals, it is important to evaluate whether the evidence is sufficiently robust. This assessment depends on the total number of participants and events analyzed. If the effect estimates are based in a small number of participants or events, rating down due to imprecision may still be warranted. Dissemination bias. This domain evaluates whether the accessibility of study results is determined by the nature of their findings. Although there are considerable challenges in judging the presence or absence of dissemination bias, the methods used in a systematic review, the characteristics of the body of evidence and certain statistical tools may be useful when judging its influence on the certainty of the evidence. Let's recap what we've reviewed so far. In the grade approach, randomized trials start as high certainty evidence, while non-randomized studies generally start as low certainty evidence. Then, five domains are assessed sequentially, study limitations, inconsistency, indirectness, imprecision, and dissemination bias. For example, imagine we're assessing a body of evidence for a specific outcome based on randomized trials. If there are serious concerns about study limitations and imprecision, Grade users may decide to rate down the certainty by one level for each domain. Since randomized trials start as high certainty evidence, rating down by one level for study limitations and another for imprecision would lower the certainty from high to low. Thus, the final rating for that outcome would be low. In addition to the five domains that allow rating down the certainty of evidence, Three other domains enable increasing the certainty by one or two levels when evaluating non-randomized studies. These domains involve situations such as observing a large effect of the intervention, identifying a dose-response gradient, or recognizing plausible residual confounding that would likely reduce an observed effect. In each scenario, a special characteristic of the data strengthens the inference of causality therefore increasing the confidence in a non-trivial effect of the intervention. So far, in this video we have reviewed the concept of certainty of the evidence in the evaluation of interventions. The five domains used to rate down the certainty are also relevant in other applications of the grade approach, although their operationalization may differ depending on the context. We now are moving to another central grade concept, the strength of recommendations. 
This is part of the broader theme involving the process of making decisions using grade. The grade working group has developed evidence to decision frameworks in order to help guideline panels to use the available evidence and to develop decisions and recommendations in a structured and transparent way. Guideline panels typically rely on multiple streams of evidence to formulate recommendations. Ideally, this evidence is gathered through systematic reviews summarized within the evidence to decision framework and used to make decisions and recommendations. At a high level, the default evidence to decision template for interventions synthesizes evidence on the net effect of an intervention, the variability in values, and key contextual factors including feasibility, acceptability, cost, and equity. However, it is important to emphasize that the framework is flexible and can be adapted to meet the specific needs of different organizations. Let's now review the concept of strength of recommendations. The strength of a recommendation reflects the overall balance between the desirable and undesirable consequences of implementing an intervention. When there is high or moderate certainty evidence demonstrating a clear net benefit, a guideline panel may choose to issue a strong recommendation in favor of the intervention. Conversely, if high or moderate certainty evidence indicates a net harm, a strong recommendation against the intervention may be appropriate. However, such clear-cut situations are rare. More often, the net effect of an intervention is very small, variable, or uncertain. For example, when the desirable and undesirable effects are closely balanced, the overall impact may be highly sensitive to individual values. Additionally, when the certainty of the evidence is low or very low, effect estimates become unreliable, generating uncertainty about the net effect. In these scenarios, conditional recommendations are more appropriate. Grade distinguishes between five types of recommendations, strong in favor, strong against, conditional in favor, conditional against, and conditional for either alternative. The last category applies only when comparing two active interventions. Strong recommendations indicate that a clear course of action should be followed for all or nearly all individuals across all relevant scenarios with only rare and well-justified exceptions. In contrast, conditional recommendations suggest that one option is preferred for the majority of individuals and situations, but that other choices may be reasonable depending on values or specific circumstances. And that brings us to the end. In this video, we offered a high-level overview of GRADE's central concepts and procedures. For more information, don't forget to visit the GRADEBOOK website and follow us on LinkedIn. Thank you for watching.